Well, thank you everyone for attending. Um, uh, <clears throat> thank you especially for leaving uh, good lunch food to attend my talk. That means a lot to me. So hopefully everyone's filled up on their banana pudding and is ready to listen and uh, listen to a talk on credit contraction. Um, so <clears throat> I know a dis difficult task uh, stands uh, before me, making sure no one falls asleep. So I, I can't promise success, but I'll certainly try. Right? It's good to see so many dedicated Austrians uh, at this event. Now, what did you do last weekend? Well, I went to a conference on a book published 75 years ago. Right? You know, most people would stop at a book published 70 years ago. So, you know, thanks for going the extra mile, right? right. Uh, in, in all honesty, I'm, I'm, I'm really honored to be speaking at this event. I want to uh, thank Greg Hill for sponsoring this talk. Uh, it means a lot to me. And you know, I purchased my first copy of, 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 of Human Action during my senior year of high school. So that was uh, in uh, 2008. And my wife brought three copies of Human Action to our marriage, including a 1949 first edition. So that's when you know you picked the winner, right? Uh, and so it completely changed my life. You know, human Action, not my wife, but um, I know. So <laughs> no, but but in all seriousness, my wife has changed my life. I mean, like I said, she brought the 1949 edition uh, to, to to my library. So that really means a lot to me. Um, but in all seriousness, with human action, I, I had the key to the world. And I remember attending my first Ron Paul event back in uh, 2010. And I waited in line for him to sign my, my copy of End the Fed. And I was, I was so nervous. And I was just, yeah, this is my idol. And I was, I was going up to, to talk to him. And I thought I'd be very calm and, and collected. And you know, when I went up to him, I blurted out, I, I've read human action. Right? I, I, I didn't really know what I was expecting from that. Maybe like a secret handshake, or he'd make me his his VP nominee or something. You know, a, a boy could dream, but 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 anyway. Um, so, but you know, in all seriousness, 75 years later, unlike so many of Mises' critics, Human Action is still read and quoted. I mean, it's it's truly an incredible thing to, to have a conference that's it's so well attended uh, about a book published uh, so long ago. The Keynesians of the 1940s and 1950s are long gone. No one reads Paul Samuelson anymore or quotes from Paul Samuelson, but Mises' ideas still resonate, right? And, 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 and why is that? And that's because Mises' ideas were innovative, they were insightful, and they were radical. Right? They inspired economists to develop, def uh, defend, and further refine uh, the ideas. And, and this continues to this day. Every scholar here, every fellow, every senior fellow of the Mises Institute, we all stand on Mises' economic theory. We all try to elaborate and defend what he wrote. And we all truly stand on the shoulders of a giant. And it's an honor to be uh, associated with Mises. So today, I want to show Mises' lasting influence by talking about his analysis of credit contraction or a decrease in the money supply during a downturn or the de depression phase of a business cycle. The most economists, past and present, they, they abhor monetary contraction. They, they hate it. You know, the Federal Reserve, when it raises interest rates, it's, it's, it always does it reluctantly. It's the lesser of two evils. And in financial markets, they're always, they're always jonesing for a rate cut, so to speak, waiting for the Federal Reserve to, to open up the monetary spigots again. And uh, there are even many Austrians, the monetary disequilibrium theorists, who by and large are opponents of credit contraction, especially during a downturn. If anything, they want uh, the banking system to increase the money supply during a depression and not to go down. So in contrast, what I want to show is that Mises argued that a decrease in the money supply had no long-lasting effects and was less harmful than credit expansion. Right? And that's, that's extremely radical because to even consider credit expansion harmful, as we'll see, is, is, very, is, is very radical for Mises' uh, position for Mises to hold. And then what I want to do is I want to show how Murray Rothbard, right, Mises' foremost student and defender of his praxeological system, uh, built upon his mentor's insights to refine his ideas, to show that credit contraction or a decrease in the money supply uh, during a downturn can actually be beneficial. It can help with the adjustment process. And this is something that Joe Salerno and I discuss extensively in our forthcoming book, The Making of a Misesian Economist. Right? So Rothbard stood on the shoulders of Mises. Rothbard defended his praxeological system, tried to make some minor changes, right? elaborate, refine it, better defend it. And that's how science progresses. Right? So that's kind of the overarching theme I want, to, uh, I, you know, I want everyone to take away from my talk. All right, so where to begin? A uh, long time ago, 
uh, a galaxy far, far away. Mises' Human Action was published in September of 1949. And some of the reviews were quite negative. So Seymour Harris, he was a prominent economics professor at Harvard. Um, it's Harvard, what are you going to do, right? Uh, he wrote a review in the Saturday Review of Literature. So Harris was a very prominent Keynesian economist. He had edited a book in 1947 titled The New Economics, Keynes' Influence on Theory and Public Policy. So I think we all know where this review is going. Um, so Seymour Harris starts his review by stating that human action is, quote, a capitalist manifesto, obviously in reference to the communist manifesto. Uh, he continues, a belligerent attack on Marxism, on Keynesianism, on state interventionism generally, and above all, apotheosis of the businessman. Right, so it's, it's pretty much kind of what Joe Salerno is saying, but instead of defending what Mises is saying, he's kind of attacking uh, what Mises is saying, right? And so Harris is criticizing Mises for his outdated defense of laissez-faire. Uh, but Mises on the downturn or the depression phase of the business cycle, that, that really irked Harris. He got, he got really upset. And he says, quote, deflation, right, or the declining phase of economic activity has no terror for our author. Leave it to the businessman very bourgeoisie, right? Uh, he will put us through, in fact, von Mises welcomes the deflation or the, or the bloodletting stage of business activity, right? So apparently it's the bloodletting stage. Austrians, we advocate leeches and, you know, all, all of the old stuff. Uh, so von Mises unfortunately does not understand Keynesian economics or else misrepresents it. Keynesian stressed the need of more and more, uh, more money and more spending in a depression. He goes on how this boosts economic activity and how Mises misinterprets him and all this stuff, right? But the key thing I want you to understand is, so Harris views the Austrian interpretation of the depression as the bloodletting stage, right? This is the, the, the liquidationist stage. Austrians just advocate pain for the sake of pain, right? So what I want to do is I want to discuss Mises' bloodletting uh, in more depth, as well as, of course, Rothbard's analysis of it. So hopefully we all know Austrian business cycle theory. I won't go into detail. I know that we all had to draw Hayekian triangles to get admitted to this event. At least that's what they told me I had to do, so I don't know if you guys had to do that as well. Uh, but for Mises, credit expansion and the resultant increase in the money supply artificially di distorts interest rates, and this causes unsustainable booms and inevitable busts. Right, the, the important interest rate for Mises and the Austrians is, is not the interest rate in the loan market, but it's, it's actually the average underlying rate of return that can be earned throughout the production structure. Right, and this represents the, uh, really is equivalent to the price spreads, uh, the rate of price spreads in the economy, aka the difference between the cost that an entrepreneur has to pay, the factors of production, and the revenue he receives. Right, and Mises says that the interest rate is determined by the societal rate of time preference or the proportion of consumption spending uh, to uh, savings, right, or in, 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 in its corollary investment, right? So for Mises, Mises has a pure time preference theory of the interest rate. Hopefully for those, you know, who, who, who've read Human Action, we really, we really get this point. I'll... Um, I'll just mention a, a, a joke here that I, I went to the uh, the bar at the hotel last night and I asked for a rum and coke and the bartender said, "Do you want ice in the summer or ice in the winter with that?" So hopefully, you know, for those of you who've read who've read that passage. But um, uh, <laughs> okay, all right. So Mises calls this time preference determined rate of interest the originary rate of interest. So in the free market, the rate on loans reflects this originary rate. Right? It, it, an entrepreneur is not going to borrow at 8% and then invest in the production structure to only earn 5%. Right? Of course, the problems, as we all know, uh, these emerge with the central bank because the central bank's credit expansion artificially lowers the loan rate uh, below the originary rate. And this misleads entrepreneurs who embark upon production processes, even though there aren't enough savings to complete them. And Mises calls uh, these projects malinvestments. And, and, and we can get into, well, the, you need more and more credit expansion to keep these malinvestments profitable, uh, and so on and so forth, right? So Mises criticizes the boom for causing all of the problems. Uh, but of course, this boom is what the government and many other sort of special interests really love. And I have a great quote from Mises here where he really gets at the essence of credit expand, expansion. This is one of those radical, one of those so many radical ideas Mises uh, mentioned. So he's got credit expansion is the government's foremost tool in their struggle against the market economy. In their hands, it is the magic wand 
right, designed to conjure away the scarcity of capital goods, to lower the rate of interest or to abolish it altogether, right, negative interest rates, uh, to finance lavish government spending, to expropriate the capitalists, to contrive everlasting booms, and to make everybody prosperous. Expansionism is the great slogan of our day. All political parties and all pressure groups are firmly committed to an easy money policy. Right? This is one of those many passages that still resonates. Right? Can, can anybody say that Mises' words, which you wrote 75 years ago, don't apply to the world we live in? That the Federal Reserve doesn't think that credit expansion or expansionary monetary policy isn't a magic wand, that credit expansion isn't supposed to finance government spending, or we're not just supposed to drive the interest rate to zero. There's no such thing as scarcity of capital goods, right? Any of that. I mean, um, you know, no wonder Seymour Harris was so upset because he was really sort of showing, explaining what credit expansion, uh, a, a favorite tool of, of the Keynesians uh, in their arsenal, uh, what it really was, right? So if this wasn't heretical enough, Mises is totally against credit expansion during a depression. And this is, this, is, uh, this is outlandish. This is ridiculous. How could Mises possibly think that? Right? Mises doesn't think that the government should increase the money supply during a downturn. Right? And as we all know, the unsustainable boom causes prices to rise higher and higher. And either the central bank has to, it keeps printing more money, which causes higher inflation, if not hyperinflation, or uh, the central bank reluctantly slams its foot on the brakes. Right, but this reveals the unprofitability of the malinvestments and begins the depressionary phase, the bloodletting phase, right, where entrepreneurs have to reallocate resources to where they are now more profitable, given society's actual savings, right, given the scarcity of capital goods. All right, uh, big banks and politicians clamor for easy money, but writes me, quote, there is no use in interfering by means of credit expansion with the process of readjustment. This would at best only interrupt, disturb, and prolong the curative process of the depression, if not bring about a new boom with all of its inevitable consequences. All right, so this is another one of those passages that, that resonates 75 year, years later, because Mises is attacking the US government's number one tool during a depression, which is just to print more money, right? Uh, you know, instead of uh, increasing the money supply, to lower interest rates. What Mises and the Austrians argue is that the loan rate of interest, right, the, the interest rate on uh, in, in financial markets, and the price spreads of the economy, after they were distorted by the credit expansion, they need to adjust back to the originary rate of interest. They need to adjust back to where they reflect time preferences. Right, so entrepreneurs, they need to liquidate the malinvestments, and they need to redirect those resources to where they are more feasible, again, given uh, what people are actually willing to save. And Mises argues that credit expansion prevents this from happening and it, it just aggravates the adjustment process, right? So that's, you could say, strike number two for, for Seymour Harris. He's against credit expansion during a boom. He's against credit uh, expansion during a bust, right? So, so, so Harris, is, 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 as was many other Keynesians of the day, uh, was, was very irked by Mises' comments. So, what I now want to talk about, sort of the, the, the central point of my talk, is what about credit contraction? Right? What about an outright decrease in the money supply during the bust phase? Right? So as we'll see, Mises considered monetary contraction to have no benefits during a depression, but there was nothing the government could do. And, and moreover, it was less harmful than a credit expansion. So let's discuss what Mises writes. Uh, we can go through the two scenarios he mentions. He says, suppose during a depression, uh, banks, uh, they're, they're worried about suffering a bank run, so they build up reserves, or some banks actually fail. Right? This decreases the supply of bank credit. This decreases the supply of fiduciary media. And this raises uh, what Mises says it will raise the loan rate above the originary rate. So instead of credit expansion artificially lowering the loan rate above the originary rate, now credit contraction pushes it the other way, right? Sort of it, it overshoots, right? At least this was the only scenario Mises talked about. So writes Mises, quote, projects which would have appeared profitable before appear so no longer, right? Because interest rates are now higher. And he says, thus, a cash-induced rise in the loan rate, or what Mises calls this the gross market rate, but we can say the loan rate, 
produces a temporary stagnation of business. He does say this. He says, credit contraction um, uh, is an element disarranging the smooth course of economic activities in sources of disturbance. Right. And again, interest rates are higher than what they would have been. And uh, they're going to you know, entrepreneurs are going to invest less and so on. But this is very important that according to Mises, the pain is minimal because there are no long lasting distortions or depletions of savings. Right. So for Mises, prices are going to fall. They're going to uh, adjust. And that's going to cause entrepreneurs to demand less uh, 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 loans because they, uh, they don't need as big of loans if the prices of, of buildings and machines are going down. And that's going to cause the loan rate to go back down to the originary rate. And moreover, the credit contraction is going to lead to lower incomes of, of workers who are fired, and they're going to reduce their consumption and provide more savings to fuel the economy. So for me, it's the freely flexible price system of a capitalist economy and, and savings, you know, that's key. So to quote Mises, he says, contraction produces neither malinvestment nor overconsumption. The temporary restriction in business activities that it engenders may, by and large, be offset by the drop in consumption on the part of the discharged wage earners. No protracted scars are left. Right? So this is, this is strike three, we could say, for Harris. So we can see why human action upset him so much, because credit expansion during the boom was bad, credit expansion during the bust was bad, and credit contraction wasn't as bad as credit expansion. It was even kind of overall sort of neutral to Mises. Right? So where does Murray Rothbard fit into all of this? So Rothbard was never technically Mises' student though he attended his New York University seminar in the 1950s, you know, where Mises taught from human action and in many of his other works. Rothbard, during this time period, was a student at Columbia. Um, and what I want to show is that Rothbard built on uh, Mises' analysis of credit contraction. And I, argue, uh, I would argue he improved it. Uh, he made it even more radical, right, or e e even more, you could say, um, uh, laissez-faire, uh, or liquidationist uh, by showing, and this is the real controversial part, it's that credit contraction actually has beneficial effects during the downturn phase. Right? And so he explained this the best in America's Great Depression, which was a book that came out uh, in 1963. So Mises was a very big fan of Rothbard, uh, as Joe Salerno and I will show in our forthcoming book. And in fact, Mises wrote the letter of recommendation for Murray Rothbard to receive the research grant to write America's Great Depression. All right, so here's what Mises wrote. This was in 1956 uh, when Rothbard, he got a research grant to write America's Great Depression. Uh, Mises described Rothbard as, quote, an extraordinarily talented young man, a keen thinker and an indefatigable worker. I'm fully convinced that he will one day be counted among the foremost economists. I fully endorse what he says about these matters. And I want merely to add that, in my opinion, nobody is better qualified to perform this job than Rothbard. Right. The letters of recommendation Joe Slurno writes for me aren't quite as good, but you know they're they're kind of around that, at least I would say. Right. Oh. Yeah. All right. So so what did uh, what did Rothbard write in America's Great Depression? So what Rothbard wrote, and in, in, uh, he says, "quote Even the Misesian theorists deplore deflation and have seen no benefits accruing from it. Yet." Deflationary credit contraction greatly helps speed up the adjustment process and hence the completion of business recovery in ways as yet unrecognized. Right? So he says, even the Misesian theorists deplore deflation, and, but in reality, deflation can have some benefits that are not recognized. This, I think, is Rothbard's sort of subtle way of kind of gently criticizing Mises and showing how he's going to try to improve on uh, his, his edifice. Right, And this is the progression of science. So here's what Rothbard writes. He says, credit contraction's first effect is to lower the money supply in the hands of business, particularly in the higher stages of production. This reduces the demand for factors of production in the higher stages, which lowers their prices and incomes, and that increases price differentials in the interest rate. Right? So it's actually adjusting the price spreads in the loan rate back to where um, uh, what's determined by the originary rate. It's not necessarily an overshooting, as Mises argued. And he continues, he says, it spurs the shift of factors in short, from the higher to the lower stages. But this means that credit contraction, when it follows upon credit expansion, speeds the market's adjustment process. 
Credit contraction returns the economy to free market proportions much sooner than otherwise. This is a very important uh, advancement, I would argue. Rothbard argues that credit contraction, it's not always an overshooting. It doesn't always have to raise the loan rate above the originary rate. It can actually bring the loan rate closer to the originary rate. And moreover, it helps the adjustment process because it's adjusting the rate of price spreads in the economy. Right, so I, I think this is uh, this part is, is 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 very important, and this is the this is the real sort of bloodletting, at least according to Harris. Right, this is the well. Now you're actually advocating to decrease the money supply during a depression. Right, but Rothbard, as was Mises, they were not advocating pain for the sake of pain. Right, you know, Rothbard, along with Mises, is saying that the government needs to get rid of the malinvestments and reallocate the resources that were misallocated during the Depression. And this analysis, I think, is what so upset Seymour Harris at Harvard University, because this is there's no role for the government in this process, right? So to conclude, Mises' business cycle analysis was innovative, it was original, uh, it was insightful, it was radical. Uh, he showed that the government's favorite tool, credit expansion, caused all sorts of problems, and it wasn't this magic wand, right? Uh, it wasn't con couldn't conjure away scarcity. Um, it was credit contraction during a bust. It, it, it was not the end of the world, as believed by so many contemporary economists. And it was up to his foremost student, uh, Rothbard, to show that really credit contraction is the flip side of credit expansion. Right? C credit expansion causes problems and leads to the business cycle, while credit contraction can help the economy correct more quickly from the business cycle. And I think this is very important. And again, this is, this is how science advances. This is why we are all still interested in human action, because we all want to defend, advance, sort of, and in, 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 in better articulate or just communicate it, uh, those ideas uh, in the world we are in right now. So I, you know, in conclusion, I exhort to all of you, I say, read the great book of Mises. Uh, it's the foundation that all of us have tried to uh, to develop uh, and defend the, the, the you know the the the, the, the praxeological edifice of economic theory. So I think with that I will conclude. And there's a couple minutes left for uh, questions. So thank you all for for not falling asleep. Right. So. Thanks.